Hello there, you're watching the press preview, our first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. And it's time to see what's making the headlines with the political editors of The Daily Mirror and The Sun, Pippa Creera and Harry Cole. So good to see you both. Good evening to both of you. Very happy to say you're both going to be with us all the way through till midnight. Uh, first, though, let's take a look at what's making the front pages, shall we, this evening. And The Guardian reports that the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, will use his budget speech on Wednesday to announce an end to the public sector pay freeze and an increase in the national minimum wage. And that's also the top story for The Telegraph 2, which says five million workers will be affected by that change. According to the Daily Mail, 7 million people stand to be better off. While The Express puts the figure at 8 million. Meanwhile, The Times warns motorists to brace for a winter of rising costs amid rising fuel prices. The eye hears from a former senior advisor to the government on education who believes that pupils should be given more help to catch up on their studies after the pandemic. Criticism of recycling by the Prime Minister a week before the COP26 climate summit is the lead story for the Metro. According to the Financial Times, concerns over security have been prompted by the UK's three spy agencies contracting with Amazon to host classified documents on its AWS cloud service. The Star reports on fears of a shortage of bus drivers... And The Sun has heard that the next series of The Crown will recreate the famous TV interview between Princess Diana and Martin Bashir, despite apparent objections from Prince William. So, plenty to get our teeth into there with Pippa Creera and uh, Harry Cole. Uh, welcome, welcome to both of you. We are kicking off um, with uh, a story that's featuring, as we saw there, on a couple of the front pages. Um, the Guardian, first of all, Pippa, uh, their headline is Soon Act to Scrap Public Sector Pay Freeze Amidst amid cost of living crisis. So yet another announcement ahead of the budget and uh, not the first one of the day to, to tackle this cost of living crisis. Yes, um, there's a couple of big announcements on pay um, today ahead of ahead of the budget. I mean, I'm sure we'll come to the fact that the government has seems to have announced most of its budget in advance of the the actual statement, which has obviously got the, the speakers back up and is a rather unusual way to approach things. Um, but uh, we've heard a lot from the government in recent weeks about uh, wages and their uh, desire to drive up wages and make Britain a a high wage economy. Of course, this has always been very tricky because it's set against the backdrop of years and years of public sector pay freezes. And uh, if you look at sort of real terms, um, pay of the public sector teachers, the NHS and so on, compared to when the Conservatives came to power, it's not a very pretty picture. And then the second aspect of it is, is of course, the minimum wage. Um, now, the, the increase in the minimum wage, which has been announced or been confirmed tonight, um, is as recommended by the Low Pay Commission. And of course, it's great news that the government has decided to, um, to, to back that increase from £8.91 an hour to £9.50 per, per hour. That will mean um, a great deal to lots of people, uh, particularly low paid people. However, um, I think it's worth saying that the government claims that this is going to increase salary for some of the worst paid, the lowest paid by £1,000 a year are very far from the mark. And you have got really respected economists, including people like Paul Johnson from the IFS, suggesting today that it's obviously not true that it's going to bring them £1,000 extra a year. And of course, it's also against the backdrop of the, the rising cost of living crisis, energy prices going up, universal credit being cut by more than £1,000 a year for many of these same people. Um, and next year's national insurance tax increases. So overall, while of course you'd welcome an increase to the minimum wage, it's not quite as clear cut as saying that everybody's going to get all that money when cost of living pressures are so huge. Harry, what do you make of this? I mean, the Daily Telegraph picks up the same story, doesn't it? Pay rise for five million public sector workers, although, as we saw earlier, <laughs> different papers um, assess uh, the, the figure differently, um, up to eight million, I think one of the papers was saying. But what do you make of that, those points that Pippa was making there. Some people are saying this it isn't actually going to make a huge amount of difference. Clearly it's welcome, but they do point out these higher inflation, this, this cut to the universal credit, the, the getting rid of the uplift, uh, but also the hike in national insurance. Is it really going to be enough to make people uh, feel better off? 
Um, I'm not sure about feeling better off, but on, on paper, it is a remarkable rise. I think it's the second largest uh, rise in the minimum wage in a single budget since um, since the financial crash. Um, someone will immediately tweet me to tell me I'm wrong on that. But that's I think it's the second or the third highest rise in, 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 in more than a decade. So look, it is a big moment. Um, Boris Johnson spent his entire conference speech talking about the fact that Britons need a pay rise. And he was de- in, trying to encourage the private sector and businesses to hike wages naturally. Now, lots of them have. Sainsbury's, for example, and Morrison's this this winter are, high, are paying um, quite significantly above the minimum wage for their temporary Christmas workers because of a shortage of workers. And HGV t- uh, companies are obviously hiking the uh, pay of um, pay of lorry drivers automatically. But to de- make that demand of, of, of the private sector, everyone basically said to the Prime Minister and to the Chancellor, you've got to pull that lever yourself as well. You've got one of the biggest levers you have, which is the pay that is the pay of the private of the public sector. Now you can't go around charging around asking everyone to, you know, give people a pay rise if you're not prepared to do it yourself. So since conference, we've been sort of slightly expecting this movement. Um, the the chancellor made a big deal tonight of the of the private sector pay freeze being a pause rather than a blanket freeze. Now obviously nurses. And NHS workers were exempt last year, which is why there's a bit of confusion about quite how many people are going to get a pay rise next year. This won't kick in until April 2022. Um, It's important to stress as well, as Pippa said, at that same time that national insurance is going to be raided uh, in order to, to pay for the NHS. So the money sort of washes around in itself. Um, but I think, you know, it, it is a significant moment. I don't think, I think probably Rishi Sunak would have quite liked some of this to, to stay under his hat, but the Low Pay Commission obviously came out today and made that recommendation. That recommendation was then circulated to, circulated to the Business Department, the Treasury, to Number 10, and well, in the, once these things are starting to fly yeah, around well, government departments, it's interesting, isn't it? He, he it, seems they to be quite happy leak. to let lots of things out from under his hat. We've had so many announcements, haven't we? As Pippa says, it's be interesting to see if there's anything left to, left to announce on Wednesday. Um, yeah. but, but Pippa, what about the fact that the Prime Minister has made it very clear that he wants to have this high-wage, high-skill economy? I mean, where, where does this leave Labour, uh, given these announcements? It, it, are the tanks on its lawn to a certain extent? Well, I think, I mean, Labour has for some time been call, calling for um, both public sector pay to be increased and the minimum wage to be increased. They've called for at least £10 an hour, which is obviously slightly higher than what we're getting. Um, and public sector pay, I think that they would make the point that while, of course, it is welcome, it is also overdue, particularly when you look at the um, the amount of effort that um, not just NHS staff, but teachers and, you know, bin collection, um, you know, refuse collection drivers and council workers and all sorts of other people put in over the course of the pandemic. Um, And of course, these are people that have seen real-term pay freezes for many years. This is not sort of like a you know, a a consistent increase in their salaries. Um, The government obviously managed to to explain this away um, last time by suggesting that because um, during the pandemic, obviously private sector pay um, had stagnated, that um, they couldn't justify putting up public sector pay. Um, That's obviously starting to change as we're seeing increases in uh, in wages for private sector workers. But, you know, your bigger point, Anna, about... um, about labour and parking tanks on lawn on the lawn. Well, I think it's I think it's absolutely the case that this is not just not just with wages, but on many issues. But one of the reasons that Boris Johnson has been so successful politically is because he has picked issues which actually unite many people and uh, perhaps are seen more traditionally as as labour issues and are trying to sort of reframe the narrative. You know, we've seen it with with him claiming that the the Tories are the party of the NHS. Well, I think they're some way off. The public being convinced of that, but it is just one example. Leveling up is another one um, of areas okay. which you would traditionally see as as being more popular with um, you know with Labour voters. And let's move on, Harry, to the eye, uh, because there are lots of demands, obviously, uh, for cash coming up with the spending review and the budget. Um, the eye focuses on schools and um, a, p- a push to get more money. Are they likely to get it? Is education going to get more money? 
Well, the reason lots of this stuff has seemed to have, have, have uh, sort of been pre-trailed, I think, is because we don't just have the budget, we have the spending review as well, which does it, which sets the departmental budgets over the next three years. So this is sort of a budget plus, if that makes sense. So a lot of the bigger figures we're seeing flying around are to do with the departmental spending for the next three years. And it does feel a little bit like, um, speaking to people tonight, that whereas the levelling up um, sort of Michael Goves of this world and um, and the NHS obviously have done well out of the spending review. There's increasing concern that the education department had have not. Now, obviously, the, uh, the the government's own sort of independent reviewer of education, what of catch up needs, Kevin Collins stormed out because he said that were they, you know, the government were woefully underfunding um, schools catch up. Obviously, there's been a change of Secretary of State as well at the Department of Education um, with Gavin Williamson's departure and, and Nadeem Zahawi's arrival. And you wondered, has something slipped through the net here? And did the has the Education Department missed out? Have they not made the best case possible for more money? Rishi Sunak was very clear on um, on a rival broadcaster um, just, uh, just the other morning saying, actually... You know, you know, the, the case for extending the school day hasn't been made. The case is actually, you know, that it's actually a much stronger argument to be to made for one-on-one -on -one tuition. Uh, sorry, sorry, small group tuition rather than extending the blanket extension of the school day. So it feels to me like there's some unresolved business there, and um, it, it might be that one of the big losers of the, uh, of the of the of the spending review is the education department, not a traditional department to take that sort of thing lying down or indeed quietly. Yeah, interesting one. And very quickly, we ought to go to a break, Pippa, but just briefly tell us, if you can, about this um, story in The Sun, in Harry's paper, of few <laughs> duty, they say. Um, this is uh, amongst the, the news today that petrol is at its highest price on record. Yeah, uh, fuel rises have meant that we've got uh, petrol per litre, an all-time high of 142.9p per litre at the pumps. Um, now, this, of course, fuel has been frozen for pretty much a decade now, the government could make a lot of money from putting fuel up, um, you know, 50 billion lost revenue for the Treasury potentially, but politically it'd be very unpalatable, particularly as the cost of fuel is so high. And there's a lot of Tory MPs in the former red wall areas, sort of, you know, blue collar um, seats who are very concerned about the impact on, you know, the white van man, um, to, to, to use a stereotype, um, but uh, the, the impact of the political fallout if they should put up petrol prices, put, put up petrol duty at this time. And Harry's obviously got the story that uh, once again, they are deciding to um, go for the politically expedient um, uh, decision and um, and uh, freeze fuel duty. Harry, I didn't realise it's actually your byline on the story and I've got Pippa to tell us about it. <laughs> That's I'm right, so Pippa, did it. <laughs> Pippa did it really well. <laughs> my apologies, it's because my eyesight isn't good enough. The writing was very small. Anyway, uh, well done, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for explaining it to us, Pippa. We will take a break there, save my blushes. Uh, do stay with us. Coming up, a criticism of the UK's spy agencies for allowing classified documents to be hosted on Amazon's online cloud service. We're going to be talking about that next. Welcome back. You're watching the press preview with me tonight, Pippa Creera and Harry Cole, taking us through the papers. And Harry, we're going to kick off this section with the front page of the Financial Times, and their main story focuses on Amazon. So, what do they say? Yeah, it's a sort of astonishing tale, really, here of the weird complex relationship that that the governments around the world do have with big tech. Now, it seems that GCHQ, our listening station, have decided to put all their baskets into Amazon for their web hosting. Um, not sorry, what web hosting, but their sort of data, their data hosting. Now, like any big organization, our, our security services are holding vast amounts of online data. Um, and you can only imagine that they're probably holding much more than most ordinary companies or firms or businesses or organizations. And it's emerged, the FT have got great stories here tomorrow that they have got put all their eggs in one basket and are only using Amazon to host it. Now that does seem like a little bit of a strategically um, closed-minded decision, I think. And perhaps, you know, given, given the problems we've had, not least with our, the British government's relationship with Amazon and their tax status, whether it was not a domestic firm that could be doing this, 
They're all out tonight saying, no, Amazon won't have any access to what's held on their servers, and they're the only company that are big enough to do it. But I suspect it will be a talker, not least when the Chancellor stands up uh, on Wednesday and starts demanding they pay more tax. Yeah, no, that, that, another one to watch for Wednesday as well. And, and Prippa, talking big tech, there's, um, Facebook has been making headlines all through the day, hasn't it? Uh, the Metro, Metro picks up on this. Uh, Facebook is making hate worse, says ex-employee. This is Francis Haugen, isn't it? Um, the, the whistleblower who's been giving evidence in America, now giving evidence here. Yes, she appeared in front of a parliamentary committee today and it was really very striking. Um, you know, she was talking about Mark Zuckerberg having the fate of 3 billion Facebook users, 3 billion, I mean, that's a massive number, isn't it? It's mm. mind-boggling, um, in, in, his, in his hands. And they, of course, include millions of children that use Instagram. And her suggestion that really struck me was that it's cheaper for the company to amplify hate and division um, divisive content than to make try and make the web a, a sort of a or social media a more sort of compassionate, caring place. She suggested it would it would take about it would sliver off about 0.5 percent of um, of the company's growth, which um, you know we, we're talking billions and billions of pounds, but it's 0.5 percent, and you'd like to think that they might be prepared to do it, but apparently not. They're more concerned, according to her, about the bottom line and shareholders rather than users. And she warned that events such as the US Capitol riots, the genocides in Myanmar and Ethiopia were just, the, her words, the opening chapters of worse events that okay. could follow were, were, Facebook no more, were Facebook not better regulated in other parts of the world and, of course, the West as well.